Hi, welcome back from the break. And we are now going to enter into chapter 29, which is about World War I. So I know that many of you have long awaited getting into World War I and then in between the two world wars. And then, of course, our class will culminate and finalize with chapter 32, which is World War Number 2. Today, the actual goal is to just talk about how World War I began and what are some of the things that led into that full-scale worldwide war. Now, we will talk about Section 1 today and the uh, things that led into World War I. Really, there were a lot of rising tensions in Europe. You know, there were a lot of countries that kind of on edge with each other. Um, it's, you know, early 1900s. There hasn't been a major war. Uh, so a lot of these countries have been building up militaries over and over, and then they're just really ready to use those militaries, which is unfortunate. But that's really part of the true history there. Also, the rise of nationalism was a big factor in leading into World War I. Remember, we learned about nationalism a few chapters ago. It's a deep devotion to one's nation. It can be a, uh, both a unifying force, but also it can create a highly competitive mentality with other countries. In the early 1900s, nationalism actually was fueling a rivalry among the five great powers in Europe. Those powers, once again, are Germany, Austria-Hungary, Great Britain, Russia, and France. Now, Italy at this time would be a sixth great power that's coming into play. They were on the rise at this time. The rivalry among these nations was actually caused by several factors, including competition for materials and markets, but also territorial disputes. So when you look at it historically, most of your rivalries, most of your big picture wars and conflicts, they're over land and resources. I mean, this has been since uh, we learned about uh, pre-Sumerian times, pre-Egyptian times with the initial bands and tribal issues of warfare. It's always been about land and resources when you really break it down. Capital B talks about imperialism and militarism. You were responsible for reading chapter 27, which is all about imperialism. It was another force that created competition among European countries. Really, these European countries, Great Britain, Germany, France, Italy, they were competing to establish colonies in Asia and Africa. Uh, don't forget, let's throw the Dutch in there as well. Uh, they were also in on a lot of the exploration at the time. Capital C, we talked about that military arms race. By 1914, all of the great powers had large and well-trained armies. There was one exception to that. That was Great Britain. You know, Great Britain was an island nation, so they focused more on the Navy than they did on the Army. Military leaders also um, established at this time very what we call detailed mobilization plans. I'd like to explain that real quick. Basically, your mobilization plan is how you get your troops from the barracks to the front lines. You know, how do you get from the barracks to the front lines? That's really what a mobilization plan is, how fast you can do that, how fast you can mobilize, in a sense, your troops to get ready for war. Point number three is a key term called militarism. Militarism is simply the policy of prioritizing military power and making sure that your army is well trained and prepared for battle. Next, we'll talk about some of the alliances that existed um, and some of the alliances that were put in play uh, prior to World War I beginning. If you remember, we learned about a key leader from Prussia slash the unification of Germany named Otto von Bismarck. He used both uh, diplomacy but also military power to unify Germany. And once he was able to unify Germany, which was a combination of Prussia, Germany, parts of uh, Austria, uh, he began to then focus on keeping peace. And this happens to start around 1871. Bismarck felt in his mind that France was really the biggest threat in Europe and especially the biggest threat to Germany. He thought that they were angry due to a, a loss that they occurred uh, or suffered to the Germans um, and uh, it was called the Franco-Prussian War. The goal of Bismarck was to actually isolate France by making an alliance with all of the great powers in Europe before France could make an alliance with them. The alliance that he was able to set up became known as the Triple Alliance. This was Germany, Austria-Hungary, which was a combined entity at the time, and Italy, that rising power that we talked about earlier, a newly unified nation in itself. 
Before this alliance, though, there were two events. In 1879, Germany and Austria-Hungary created their own alliance. And then in 1881, Germany, in a separate fashion, made an alliance with Russia. So Germany has pretty much acquired alliances or agreements, at least, with many of the great powers in Europe, save France, of course, which they're trying to isolate, and Great Britain. Let's talk a little bit more about German foreign policy in capital letter B. Germany is going to change their foreign policy in 1890. This is around the time that Kaiser Wilhelm II became the sole ruler of Germany. His second-hand man at that time was the Prime Minister Otto von Bismarck. He was getting pretty old. He basically forced Bismarck to resign. He doesn't want to share power with anyone any longer. He wants to make decisions on his own. This is one of the things that major emperors or kings throughout history have wanted to do. After Bismarck was let go, Wilhelm sort of didn't take care of the alliance with Russia. That was a major error. Russia then, because that alliance lapsed, they made an alliance with France in 1892 and then re-upped re their alliance in 1894. This is really what Bismarck had been totally fearful of, and I'll talk about that problem right next here. Um, a war with France or Russia for Germany at this time would make them an enemy of both because those two nations or countries are in an alliance. And what this would do, if you know the map, this would force Germany to fight a war on two fronts. On the eastern front, they'd have Russia knocking at their door, and on the western front, they'd have to deal with France. That is really a difficult task for any country. Um, Germany being surrounded by those two countries uh, would have had a hard time with that as well. But as we see later, that's going to be the case that takes place nonetheless. Kaiser Wilhelm also attempted to create a navy that he stated openly and publicly would match the British at sea. By doing this, by this word getting out in the press, you know, this causes an alarm and alerts the British. It causes them to then make a joint relationship with France and also Russia in 1907. This became known as the Triple Entente. It was an alliance of Britain, France, and Russia formed in 1907. This one was a little bit different. It did not force Britain to fight alongside with France and Russia, but it did ensure that they would not fight against each other. Now, to recap where we're at right now, in Europe, there were two major divisions. You've got the Triple Alliance, which was Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. And then you've got the Triple Entente, which is the opposite end of that spectrum, Great Britain, France, and Russia. What this basically means is that any dispute between any two of these major rivals may indeed cause all nations to get involved in a major war. Roman numeral three is going to switch the focus to a region in the Balkans, which is down in the southern and southeastern portion of Europe. It's a mountain range there. It's kind of known as what we call the powder keg. There's a lot of animosity between small nations there, racial differences, ethnic differences, uh, cultural differences and practices were causing a lot of major issues between some of these countries. The Ottomans were in control of a lot of these small, now independent nations for a great deal of time in the Balkan Peninsula. But here are some of the new nations that formed when the Ottomans sort of went uh, into a decrease in power. You have Bulgaria, you have Greece regaining its independence, uh, Montenegro, Romania, and Serbia. Some of these countries are still in existence. They're pretty small uh, normally. Now, point number two. Now, when you talk about Serbia, Serbia had a very large, what we call Slavic population. If you remember back in chapter 11, way long time ago, we learned about the Slavs and how they kind of blended with the Vikings. And this is what formed early Russia. Well, Slavic is an ethnicity. It's basically a, a language as well. And uh, so Russians were supporting Serbians because both of them had a very high Slavic population. So they had that cultural and uh, ethnocentric um, basis to go together in. Austria-Hungary is another country that has a very large, what we call Slavic state. And um, they you know, had rebellions within their own country and their own regions of the Slavic peoples. And in 1908, looking to expand their territory and expand their Slavic peoples, Austria took over the small nation states of Bosnia and Herzegovina. These are two Balkan regions with very large Slavic population. This definitely angered the Serbian leaders who wanted to rule these two areas also. 
This created what we know as a, as a pre-war standoff between Serbia and Austria-Hungary. Now, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand is a very, very critical moment in the start of World War I. You cannot learn about World War I without talking about this major historical and singular event. Franz Ferdinand was the heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary. He's next in line. In June of 1914, he and his wife Sophie visited Sarajevo, which is the capital of Bosnia. Now, remember, they just took over Bosnia, so they're kind of going in there to say, hey, you know what, we took you over, but we want to make you a part of our empire, and you know, we really want to welcome you in, and so it's kind of a celebration. As they rode through the streets of Sarajevo, it was in an open-topped car, so no top, kind of like what you might think of as a convertible with the top down today. The assassin that shot them, shot them at point-blank range. He was a 19-year-old Serbian named Gavriel Princip. Sometimes you'll hear his name as Princip. Uh, nonetheless, very young. He was known to be a member of the Black Hand, which was a secret society which was created to get Bosnia out of Austrian control. I'm going to have a video about this because there's really a, a pretty interesting story about how that assassination took place. There really was uh, or really were two assassination attempts on the same trip. One was a grenade or a small bomb that was thrown at the car. It bounces off the car and then explodes and actually does damage to the car behind the Archduke and his wife. Then, for some reason, they continue with the trip at a, at a later hour in the day, and they make a wrong turn, which puts them in sort of an alleyway, and it just so happens that one of the other members of the Black Hand, who turns out to be Prince Seep, was in a coffee house slash kind of a bar, and uh, he sees the car, he has a, a pistol on him, he walks out, and at point blank range, he assassinates the Archduke and, and his wife. So a very sad event, uh, but one that was catastrophic in leading into World War One. A lot of lives lost due to either a wrong turn or just a happenstance there. Now, Austria, they're going to be extremely mad about this. They knew they must retaliate against Serbia. They believe that Serbia did this. They believe that Serbia sent these guys in there to assassinate their next in line. Austria presents Serbia with an ultimatum of war with several serious demands. They say, look, you either do this, do this, do this, or we're going to declare war on you. Serbia agrees to most of the demands to avoid war. They're a very small nation. They really don't want to mess with Austria on their own. Um, and they, but they also do ask to negotiate on some of the matters. Austria's like, no, nope, no way, not going to happen. We're not going to negotiate after you just assassinated our Archduke. And so Austria does not accept Serbia's call for negotiation and declared war on them officially July 28th, 1914. Now, remember, Serbia and Russia are boys and Austria and Hung Austria, Hungary and Germany are boys. So what happens is Russia, as soon as they hear about this, because they're boys with Serbia, they automatically begin to mobilize their troops to the Austrian and German border, readying themselves for war. The Allied forces now all kind of talked about, hey, Austria and Russia, let's just settle this down. Let's see if we can negotiate about, about this. But it seemed as if war really uh, was on its way. I'm going to switch my screen for you guys, and I'm going to try to use this system to show you a, about a three or four minute video so you can see what I'm talking about with the assassination of the Archduke. So hopefully this will work. Okay, looks like we're here. I'm going to need to uh, take myself out of the picture here for just a moment, guys, um, and uh, I will I will start this video up. Just give me one second. Okay, I should be able to go full screen. All right, sorry for the delay, fellas, and uh, I will start the video. Please pay attention. Don't don't click us off just yet. Sure. Most would say World War I started with a gunshot. But there's a lot more to the story. This is Leopold Loika. He was born on September 17, 1886, in the old Bohemian village of Telsch. 
Originally a horse wrangler, Leopold moved on to real horsepower when he became Archduke Franz Ferdinand's chauffeur in 1909. Archduke Ferdinand was first in line to the Austro-Hungarian throne, then occupied by Emperor Franz Joseph I. But serving as emperor wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Austria-Hungary wasn't exactly the most popular European country at the time. 1908. The Austro-Hungarian Empire annexes Bosnia. This ticks off Bosnian nationalists, who wanted to unify all southern Slavic countries under one government. Tensions are still high in 1914, when Archduke Ferdinand decides to visit Bosnia. If there were any place where Ferdinand were to get got, Sarajevo, Bosnia's capital, would be it. Despite this, Ferdinand decides to drive around Sarajevo with the top down in his limousine. Leopold Loika is driving, when, out of the corner of his eye, he spots a small bomb hurtling towards the Archduke and his wife. He slams on the gas, and the bomb misses its target. The bomb was thrown by Nedelko Chabrinovic, a member of the Young Serbian Nationalist Movement. There are a few injuries, but Ferdinand and his wife are unharmed. After gathering their bearings, Leopold drives on to a scheduled meet-and-greet between the Archduke and local officials. The officials want to take the Archduke on a tour of the city, but Ferdinand instead decides he wants to visit the wounded victims from the bomb attack. He gets back into the car with his wife and has Leopold drive off to the hospital. In all fairness to Leopold, he didn't know the exact route. No map, no GPS. He made a mistake and turned on to the wrong street. Unfortunately for Leopold and the rest of Europe, this was the street where Gavrilo Princip, one of the co-conspirators of the earlier assassination attempt, happened to be having a drink. Princip can't believe his luck. He has an opportunity to finish out what he started earlier that day. As the crowd tries to subdue Princip, the Archduke and his wife are left bleeding in the car. One bullet struck the Archduke in the neck, the other his wife in the stomach. Both die within the hour. In response to the assassination of the heir to its crown, Austria-Hungary seeks support from Germany. Germany agrees, and Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. Russia, Serbia's ally, mobilizes its forces, and as a result, Germany declares war on Russia. Russia's ally, France, then mobilizes its forces, which causes Germany to declare war on France. In turn, Great Britain declares war on Germany. Austria-Hungary then declares war on Russia. Serbia declares war on Germany, and France and Great Britain declare war on Austria-Hungary. Hmm. It's like dominoes, guys. The first world. World. Let me go ahead and pause right there. I think you guys get the idea of how, you know, catastrophic just that one single event was in leading into World War One. You can see kind of how the dominoes come and fall um, here and there, and all the different allies join in, and that's what led us into World War One. Now tomorrow, uh, or the next uh, lesson, I should say. I was going to talk about the start of the war and, and how it went early on. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.